Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. And isn't it gorgeous? <laughs> I mean, just it's just a perfect summer's day outside. It is summer, isn't it? No, maybe it's still spring. Well, it's a perfect spring day then, but it really is. It's quite something, I think. And um, I was just comparing notes with people who have lived in other countries and saying, I can remember as a child living in South Africa, and we didn't have lovely weather like this ever. You know, we had three months of the hot, rainy season, followed by nine months of the dry, dry not quite so hot season. And you either had mud everywhere or you had dust everywhere. I like this country. I like this weather. I think this is absolutely marvellous. So enjoy it with me. <laughs> now, um, yes, I think we are going to be starting off with the introit. <laughs> seventh Sunday of Easter, but it's also Sunday following, anybody know? You can tell I'm a teacher, can't you? Almost? Ascension. The, the next one has rogation. I think rogation's next week. <laughs> so today, obviously, we are concentrating <coughs> on ascension and um, it's rather, rather nice to be able to do so. It only happens once a year, so enjoy it. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask Ken if he'll lead us in prayer. Christ did not go into a man-made holy place, which was a copy of the real one. He went into heaven itself, where he now appears on our behalf in the presence of God. Therefore, let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we worship you today as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We bring you our praise and offer you our homage, dedicating our lives to your service. We acknowledge you as sovereign over life, the Lord of creation, through whom all things were made. Without you, we would have nothing. <sighs> We acknowledge you as sovereign over death, the risen Lord who triumphed over the grave. You are the resurrection and the life. We acknowledge you as sovereign over evil, the crucified Christ who nailed our sins to the cross, who defeated the powers of darkness, 
and conquered hatred with love. Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge you as sovereign over all, Lord of space and time, ruler of the ends of the earth, enthroned in splendour <coughs> at the right hand of the Father. Blessing and honour and glory and might are yours, this day and forevermore. Lord Jesus Christ, we have let you down in so many ways. We have not behaved in the way one of your followers should behave. We have not loved our neighbour. We have been slow to forgive and to pass judgment and not caring about the needs of others. We say we are your followers, but our faith has been weak and our commitment poor. And we have allowed petty divisions to come between us. We talk of building your kingdom, but our thoughts are firmly anchored in this world and its pleasures. Yet you still love us, accepting us as we are, cleansing us from all our faults and giving us the chance to start again. We don't deserve to bear your name. We don't deserve your goodness. And there is so much about us that is wrong and so little that is right. And yet you went to the cross knowing all this, taking the punishment that should have been ours, bringing healing through your terrible wounds. Lord Jesus Christ, through you we have found joy and fulfilment, love and peace, grace and mercy. We have been given the chance to start again, to turn over a new page in our lives. Lamb of God, to you be power and wealth, wisdom and might, honour and glory and blessing. And now, in the words of Jesus, we pray together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory for ever. Amen.
Old Testament and is taken from Psalm 24 entitled The Great King. The world and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. The earth and all who live on it are his. He built on the deep waters beneath the earth and laid its foundations in the ocean depths. Who has the right to go up the Lord's hill? Who may enter his holy temple? Those who are pure in act and in thought, who do not worship idols or make false promises. The Lord will bless them and save them. God will declare them innocent. Such are the people who come to God, who come into the presence of the God of Jacob. Fling open wide the gates, open the ancient doors, and the great king will come in. Who is the great king? He is the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord victorious in battle. Fling wide the gates, open the ancient doors, and the great king will come in. Who is this great king? The triumphant Lord. He is the great king. The next reading is from Acts 1, verses 1 to 11. <coughs> Dear Theophilus, in my first book I wrote about all the things that Jesus did and taught from the time he began his work until the day he was taken up to heaven. Before he was taken up, he gave instructions by the power of the Holy Spirit to the men he had chosen as his apostles. For forty days after his death, he appeared to them many times in ways that proved beyond doubt that he was still alive. They saw him and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. And when they came together, he gave them this order. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift I told you about, the gift my father promised. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is taken up to heaven. When the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus said to them, The times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority, and it is not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up to heaven as they watched him, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away, when two men dressed in white suddenly stood beside them and said, Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? <coughs> this Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will come <coughs> back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. Thanks very much. And now the appropriate hymn, Rejoice the Lord is King.
The Gospel reading this morning is taken from Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 to 53. Jesus appears to his disciples. While the two were telling them this, suddenly the Lord himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were terrified, thinking they were seeing a ghost. But he said to them, Why are you alarmed? Why are those doubts coming up in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I, myself. Feel me, and you will know, for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. He said this and showed them his hands and his feet. They still could not believe. They were so full of joy and wonder. So he asked them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of cooked fish, which he took and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses The writing of the prophets and the Psalms has had to come true. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, This is what is written. The Messiah must suffer and must rise from death three days later. And in his name, the message about repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and I myself will send upon you what my Father has promised. But you must wait in the city until the power from above comes down upon you. Jesus is taken up to heaven. Then he led them out of the city as far as Bethany, where he raised his hands and blessed them. As he was blessing them, he departed from them and was taken up into heaven. They worshipped him and went back into Jerusalem, filled with great joy, and spent all their time in the temple, giving thanks to God. Thank you very much, Olive. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our God, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Now, in Psalm 24, we read, Fling wide the gates, open the ancient doors, and the great king will come in. Think of those lines from the psalm. Do you recognize them in any way? No, not not in that version. You'll know them better in the metrical version, which is often sung at communion services in the Church of Scotland, in the form, Ye gates, lift up your heads on high. Remember it? Ye gates, lift up your heads on high. And so on. It's a fabulous one. When it's sung unaccompanied at the General Assembly, if you've been lucky enough to get there, during the celebration of Holy Communion, or if it's sung by the smallest congregation, these words of the psalmist breathe spiritual strength and hope and spiritual fire into the heart of the worshipper. Fling wide the gates, open the ancient doors, and the great king will come in. And who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts, strong and mighty in battle, the triumphant Lord, and the gates of his kingdom are opening to admit him. This is no polite request. It's a command to open the gates as they prepare to receive their king. So the king enters to ascend the royal throne and take his place before all the people. Rather like a coronation, but not just an earthly sovereign. This is the king of glory who has been crowned and who seeks to rule the hearts of his subjects. Yes, the king of glory 
who is none other than God himself. In the calendar of the Christian year, which the Church of Scotland is not terribly good at following, I have to say, today is marked out as the Sunday after Ascension. Ascension Day, 40 days after Easter, was commemorated last Thursday. I don't suppose any of you did commemorate it. Maybe you remembered about it. I don't know. I phoned our daughter up because she is the organist in um, a parish church in a beautiful market town in, in England called Malton, near York. And I said, how did Ascension Day go? Oh, she said, it was fantastic. That's what it should be, you know. Um, but she gave them the full works, let's put it that way. When I was a child at school in South Africa, I knew about Ascension Day. How many children in school, primary school, know about Ascension Day in this country? Very, very few. We had the day off school. It was a compulsory holiday. Yay! I really enjoyed it. It was tremendous. The one problem was that we had to go away and stay with other people near the school and us um, because school was so far from us and um, meant we couldn't go home. But so what? You know, we had the day off. Oh, lovely. Absolutely lovely. And um, I was so surprised. Well, maybe I wasn't. Yes, I was. When I came to this country and the children in school in this country, in the primary school I was in, did not know about Ascension Day. Really? How could they be so ignorant? Well, they were Scots. I was getting used to the fact that Scots were ignorant about a lot of things. Sorry, I'm being rude. I am a Scot myself, you understand, right? <laughs> Just not, not born in this country, not largely brought up in this country. In his gospel, Luke provides a detailed account of the events leading up to Christ's birth, then right through his ministry to the events leading up to his death and resurrection. In Acts, what could be described as his second volume, Luke reminds his readers of the final verses of his gospel narrative, of how Jesus had appeared a number of times to his disciples during the 40 days after his resurrection, and how he had given them instructions for their own task of mission. Now they were to continue his ministry. They were to begin from Jerusalem and travel from one place to another. They were being sent out to preach the gospel everywhere they went. Then, at the end of these 40 days, Luke tells of the ascension, that final act, when in mystery and divine power, Jesus ascended to God. He was taken up to heaven as they watched him, and the cloud hid him from their sight. So as we ponder this extraordinary account by Luke, perhaps we too are left in a state of perplexity mixed with wonder. Like the disciples, perhaps we also find ourselves gazing intently into the sky, open-mouthed. Contemplating the meaning and truth of this divine mystery, not simply what the ascension meant for the disciples, but what the ascension means for us and for the whole church today. It's temptingly easy to think that the resurrection marked the final chapter of our Lord's life on earth. After all, was Christ not born to save? Does his birth in Bethlehem not point to his death on Calvary and his rising again on that early morning three days later? With the resurrection, therefore, we might conclude that everything in connection with God's plan for our salvation had been fulfilled. But we are told that Jesus remained on earth in risen form for 40 more days. It's almost as, as if he didn't want to go or as if he had something more to do. When he was born in Bethlehem, Jesus was human, just as we are with all our follies and frailties. And that, of course, included the fact of death. He was God, but he transferred to himself our weaknesses, our faults, sins, disobedience, our life and our death in order to make them his own in order to lift them from us, in order to free us from the imperfections and stains of our human condition, 
in order to make us perfect in the sight of God. All this he accomplished through his entire life, and in the end brought to pass that final moment when sin and death were destroyed, done away with forever, so that we might enter a life of true perfection and peace and everlasting joy in the Father's presence. So we find that resurrection and ascension come together. Jesus' birth leads us straight to the cross and empty tomb. They should never be looked at as separate from each other. In the same way, the resurrection cannot be separated from the ascension. With the ascension, he became free from the restraints of time and place which we have and to which he had confined himself for 33 years. He was taken up to heaven as they watched him and the cloud hid him from their sight. The ascension was indeed necessary. For just as Jesus in a moment in time had been born into the world, so in a moment of time, in time he left it. <coughs> we find it difficult to understand exactly what happened at the ascension. I mean, honestly, it sounds weird, quite frankly. Presumably the disciples must have been totally perplexed by the whole affair too. Yet theirs was not to reason why. They obeyed their Lord's instructions and returned to Jerusalem, not downcast, but with great joy, and spent all their time in the temple praising God. There was no other way that was suitable to celebrate the kingship of Jesus. His death was not the end. Therefore, Paul wrote, God raised him to the heights and bestowed on him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. The reaction of the worshipper in humility to offer praise to the risen and ascended Lord, that is how we celebrate the kingship of, God, of Christ. After Jesus had risen from the dead, the kingdom of God about which he had spoken so many times, that kingdom was no longer something people waited for. It was no longer some event that the world would, that would come about in the dim and distant future. In a real sense, that kingdom, that divine rule was happening there and then in power and majesty. But how far did people really believe the risen Christ to be the very same Jesus who they had known and loved and followed before he was put to death? After the resurrection, during those 40 days, Jesus felt the need to reassure the disciples, if indeed they shared any secret misgivings, reassure people in general that he was the same person as before. They, in turn, also required to be reassured it was a two-way process. In the words of one William Milligan, who was professor of Aberdeen some time ago, he needed to speak and walk and eat with them while they again needed to hear him, to see him with their eyes and to handle him with their hands. We are reminded of that earlier moment on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus wanted to know if people really knew who he was, so he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? The replies were several and varied. Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah. Others say you're a prophet returned from the dead. Now you, Jesus went on, who do you say I am? Then without a moment's hesitation came Peter's reply of recognition. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus came to earth as the long awaited Messiah of Israel, the promised savior who would rule the world through a kingdom of love. Jesus was born to be king, but alas, a kingdom, a king and a kingdom that were not recognized by his own nation. The king of the Jews, yes, but a king who was not crowned in glory, but crowned with thorns. A king who was rejected and put to death, yet whose rule of love and forbearance and forgiveness would conquer the evil of that cross. Jesus, the king who would rise triumphant and restore his people to his kingdom once more. 
Yes, Jesus the King, whose kingdom has no end. Jesus, the great high priest, referred to in the letter to the Hebrews, the high priest who instead of ascending the steps to the altar and offering sacrifices to God, ascended the cross in order to offer himself as the sacrifice for our sins. And Jesus, the mighty prophet who spoke on behalf of God, proclaiming divine forgiveness, a royal proclamation indeed. Well, the disciples returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Jesus was enveloped in the clouds when he ascended, as Luke says, but the disciples remained utterly convinced that Jesus had not left them for good, nor had he vanished permanently from their sight. Rather, they believed and rejoiced that he was with them forever and ever. And it's not for nothing that the church's praise for ascension tide should reflect joy and gladness rather than more somber tones. But far more so, it should also reflect the kingship of Christ, who is Lord. The Lord is king. Lift up your voice. Let earth and all the heavens rejoice. Or words from the metrical version of Psalm 68. Thou hast, O Lord, most gloriously ascended up on high. Think again of the last verses of Psalm 24. Fling wide open the gates, open the ancient doors, and the great king will come in. Who is this great king? The triumphant Lord. He is the great king. Yes, Jesus comes as ruler over his kingdom of righteousness. He ascended into the Father's presence, and there he is to be glorified by the church on earth, as well as by the church on heaven now and forevermore. Amen.
And so to our prayers of dedication, thanksgiving, and intercession. Dear God, who made everything, we thank you for the amazing beauty of this world, for the complexity of the universe, for the regular cycle of life that we know and depend on, day and night, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, and for the rich resources of this planet, and for those who labour in different ways to make them accessible to us. As we bring our offerings to you, teach us also to offer ourselves to others, to recognise that wherever there is sorrow or suffering, hunger or hardship, you are there, sharing the pain, calling for us to respond. We thank you for our minds with which to understand, inquire and learn. For senses which see, hear, smell, taste, touch. And for health to enjoy and savour and celebrate. You have blessed us with so much. Teach us to use all your gifts wisely, to offer what we can, where we can, when we can, conscious that whatever we do for anyone, we do it also for you. Father God, we pray for those who are responsible for so many different harvests, for farmers and growers in this country at this time of so much change and so many complex issues. For farmers in other lands often overwhelmed and oppressed at the mercy of extreme weather. For those who bring in the harvest of earth and sea, often risking life and limb. For those who make possible the harvest of technology, opening up new worlds and horizons. Give them help, hope, protection and dedication. We pray for all our friends and families, remembering particularly any who are in special need of healing or support. We remember those who have passed from this life, for those whose future is uncertain. We pray for our friends and families, remembering particularly any who are in special need of healing or support, particularly those known to us. We pray for those being cared for in hospitals, care homes and their own homes that their carers may show dedication and love and patience. We remember those who have been recently bereaved, not least your servant, Dane. And we ask you to comfort them and help them to feel your presence in their loss. Support and sustain all of them and give them the courage to face whatever the future may hold. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us remember all that God has done. Let us rejoice in all he is doing. Let us receive all that he shall yet do. Let us put our hand in his, the God of past, present and future, and walk with him wherever he may lead, knowing that he will walk with us today and always. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, go with us and remain with us now and evermore. comes next or whatever you choose to drink <laughs> so don't rush off do stay and share with everybody and have a good chat afterwards and thank you very much to those in the gallery who as usual work all the time Thank you.